Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson, your host from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit that supports human evolution research and shares discoveries. Today, we're delving into the complex interactions between plants and primates in Madagascar. Before we leap into this topic, uh, thank you so much to the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith, whose support made today's episode possible. Now let's bring on our guest, Baldwin Fellowship Scholar and Ecologist, Dr. Anj Rezafendrakson. Anj, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Anj is joining us from California, where she is an assistant professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at University of California, Berkeley. Anj originally hails from Madagascar and studies rainforest ecology in Renamafana National Park in southeastern Madagascar, um, which we are, uh, we took a, a nice long little flight to, um, and we're going to see some gorgeous pictures of, of this first location. Um, it's just, it's just so beautiful. And then she also works at uh, Oof Forest in the eastern part of Madagascar, which we will be seeing in just a second. And, um, and Anj is also a National Geographic Explorer, which is, which is really thrilling. Oh, these are just such such gorgeous locations. I kind of wish I was I was there right now. So before we hear from Anj, if you are watching this episode live, please post comments or questions in the chat and Anj will answer them live during the episode. The earlier you get those questions in, the more likely your question will be featured. So my first question for you, Anj, is what do conservation and ecology have to do with human evolution? Um, I think there are some aspects of ecology that can be important to understand human evolution. So, for example, uh, studies of primate behavioral ecology and traits can help shed some light on some aspects of human evolution. And currently, uh, we're facing major environmental changes that are affecting the ecology of many organisms and even the quality of their habitat and resources about uh, availability. So working toward biodiversity conservation in general can provide us the, an opportunity to maintain biodiversity that has been existing and co-evolving with us. And what are the species of lemur that you uh, get to work with and what are the differences between them? So I've been focusing most of my research on three lemur species. Um, I have Ulemur repreventer, um, uh, which is a uh, red-bellied lemur, so also known as Parthia main in Malagas, and Ulemur river fronts, a uh, red-fronted uh, brown lemur from uh, Parthia Mar in Malagas, and um, Parisia variegata in Titorum, uh, black and white uh, rat lemur from so Parisas. They are highly uh, frugivorous and are actually among the largest frugivores in Madagascar. Um, they differ in several morphological and behavioral traits. Um, the obvious morphological difference would be the color pattern. And also the rough lemurs tend to be in smaller groups, so they are sometimes easier to follow, and a little bit easier to follow than the Illumin River France, for example, uh, which tend to travel in larger groups. And these three lemur species have some overlap in their diet in terms of plant species that they consume. But there are some plant species that are only consumed by one of the other species. Beautiful. So when, when did you first see lemurs in the wild? So that would be uh, when I was in 10th grade, um, sometime in high school. So I grew up in the capital city of Antananarif in Madagascar, and we went on a school field trip in Andasi Bay in the eastern part of Madagascar as part of activities of a club of environmentalists that I was involved in. And that's where I first saw lemurs in the wild. And if I remember uh, correctly, the first lemur species I saw was a brown lemur, uh, Ulemur frippus. And then we also saw uh, some ingri ingri as well. It's amazing the diversity of, of the different lemurs. Yeah, so that's the 
in, in Greece, one of the largest lemurs or the largest. Oh, it just must have been so thrilling to get to, you know, see them in the wild. That's me when I was young, <laughs> in 10th grade, in high school, and when we went to Andasi Bay. Oh, I love it. Um, so what was your path from that experience to where you are now studying lemurs? Well, so after that, um, I was still heavily involved in the high school environmentalist club. And so we were able to like go on a couple of field trips. So that's one of our group we went to, I believe was the, um, visiting one of the national parks, I don't remember exactly, but like one of the trips brought us to Ranmafana National Park in the southeastern part of Madagascar. I feel so emotional seeing my old pictures. Um, so in the last year of high school, where um, I met a group of scientists conducting field research that involved watching animals every day while camping in the rainforest. And I didn't realize at that time that that could be a job and I could do something like that. Um, and I was so fascinated by the idea that I could be camping and then watching animals every day and that's, that's a job. Um, so later I decided to enroll in natural sciences at the University of Antananarive. Um, I didn't actually study lemurs until later when I was a master's student. So in Madagascar, we have this very cool system in which all foreigners conducting field research there should hire and mentor one Malagasy student for capacity building. So I was paired to work with Barbara Martinez, who was a PhD student from the University of Minnesota at that time. And she was studying the ecology of red raft lemurs in the northeastern part of Madagascar. So she trained me in various techniques of how to follow lemurs, how to record their behavior, how to set up plots to um, understand the, um, the availability of fruits that they have. And so with her mentorship, I developed my own research proposal that aligned with the general objectives of her research. So, and I was so curious about a lot of things. Um, and so that curiosity made me want to learn more. And so oh, yeah. I started discussing with Barbara about like pursuing a PhD um, degree. And so she gave me advice and direction about PhD programs in the US. And then she helped me with all the different processes. So to make that story short, I got accepted into a PhD program at Rice University in Houston, Texas to work with Amy Dunham. And then after graduating from Rice and then a year of postdoctoral position in the same lab, I was selected as a Harvey Fellow in Conservation Biology at Harvard University. And as a Harvard fellow, I, uh, as a Harvard fellow, uh, I had the opportunity to lead um, an independent research project and then teach an undergraduate course on conservation biology. And then I gained more teaching and research experience as visiting assistant professor and now I'm currently an assistant professor here at UC Berkeley. Uh, it's, I'm so, I, it, I really need to have you at, at UC Berkeley and be so close to the Wiki Foundation headquarters. I think you're, they were in San Francisco and, and you're, I think, the closest uh, guest we've had on North Break Science so far. Um, and you, when you were at Rice, you did some outreach with the Wiki Foundation. We are just so incredibly grateful. And I actually have heard about you since, since then. I'm like, oh, we have to, we have to collaborate at some point. So I'm really excited to be able to feature you. Um, how did being awarded the Leakey Foundation Baldwin Fellowship impact your career? So I was awarded the Baldwin Fellowship in my second and third year of PhD. And um, it was, and I think it still is, a great honor to be selected for such a very prestigious fellowship. And it was not just like a fin financial aid, which is great in that sense, because we needed money as a student but it also provided me an opportunity to get higher qualification and the training I needed to succeed as a scientist, um, to develop and improve my skills as a scientist. And even just like, for example, writing that proposal and the related report letter helped me in framing my ideas better and in explaining my work to people outside of um, my specific field. 
So I'm very grateful for the um, for the Leaky Foundation for that fellowship. These are some pictures of me in the field when I was a PhD student. Yeah, the um, the Leakey Foundation Baldwin's Fellowship Program helps students from countries with limited opportunities for advanced education related to human origins research. And to echo what Ange said, this fellowship offers crucial opportunities to help develop skills as a scientist. And uh, to learn more about this program and the qualifications, we've shared a link in the chat, so please check that out. But um, we've received a record number of applications this past year and are working to raise $90,000 to fund an additional seven fellowship. So we would love um, your help to make this possible. Donations made to the Baldwin Fellowship Program will actually be quadrupled matched thanks to a, a very generous sponsors. And um, so that basically means that like, if you give $25, you'll have $100 worth of impact, which is just really amazing. So we're, you know, as I said, grateful to our sponsors for this challenge and for all of you out there who, you know, support the Leaky Foundation. So um, my next question for you has to do with something I absolutely loved talking about with you when we first met to talk about this episode. You mentioned that you have a dream project you have. Tell us about it. Yes. So my dream project, I have so many projects, but <laughs> oh, just as a side thing, I was show, I was um, talking about getting water earlier, just aside. So I have this mark that my PhD advisor gave me before. And it says my, um, it's a Lima mark. Uh, it says my plan for world domination involves lots and lots of Limas. So my dream, one of my dream projects will definitely involve lots and lots of Limas. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. The dream project I was talking to Ariel before uh, was like in, involved the training and mentoring of more Malagasy scientists to become leaders in conservation in Madagascar. Um, that will go beyond training and assistantship in the field to truly help build a new generation of Malagasy students and researchers who would be at the forefront of conservation research in Madagascar. So that's my dream project. Um, it may involve lemurs in some ways, but I really want to build that new generation of Malagasy scientists to be the leaders of conservation in Madagascar. So that would be my dream project. Well, it's, it's really exciting to hear about. And, um, you know, I hope that, um, that, you know, you'll come back and, and be further along and then get to tell us about it. So um, what is a typical day like in the field for you and your team? Ooh, this is actually my favorite question. Actually, mine too. Because <laughs> <laughs> I really like talking about my field work. Um, so we so we usually camp inside the rainforest. And so we have this small village made of tents and tarps. Um, this is one of our field sites. And so a typical day, um, if we ever have it, one typical day, would be that we wake up to birds singing and river flowing in a very peaceful, peaceful sound. It sounds very magical, which is, and I'm looking forward to go to the field in a month. And so we'll have some, and then we'll have some delicious Malagasy food before heading to searching for lemurs. And the whole day we just consist of following lemur groups to collect data on the movement, on um, the feeding, and the defecation. Um, these are some of the yummy Malagasy foods that I love. And, and then we may collect these species and then process them back at our lab on camp, which is just a table next to the kitchen on camp. It's not a fancy lab. And since our team divides in like small groups during the day to do different activities, uh, we spend the evening catching up on the cool stuff that everyone was doing during the day, uh, relaxing by the campfire and making dinner and maybe playing some cards. It, it's fun. I, I really enjoy field work, as you can tell. I, it, it, it's, it's such a beautiful location to be. Um, I just, I can't, I can't imagine. Um, so 
I am so excited to hear more about your work and we'll be going into your talk very shortly. But before we turn the virtual floor over to you, Ange, if you are enjoying this episode of Lunch Break Science, be sure to subscribe and click the little bell to receive notifications. So you'll be the first to hear about upcoming episodes and more. So now let's turn the virtual floor over to you, Ange, and hear more about your research. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so today I decided to talk about some aspect of the mutualistic interactions between lemurs and the food plants, as I've been devoting a large proportion of my career working on that topic. And so specifically, I'm interested in the interactions between lemur frugivores and the plants that they consume in the form of um, providing seed dispersal services. And I'm approaching that topic from both ecological and conservation standpoints because I'm dealing with a very unique system and highly threatened species. And the basic idea is that these uh, lemur frugivores will consume the fruits um, whole and then defecate the seeds throughout the forest. And the passage of the seeds through the gut would improve um, seed germination. But it's, seed dispersal is a little, even more, a little bit more complex than that. Uh, it, it's actually an important process in plant life cycle. It influences the plant population dynamics because the seeds are transported away from the vicinity of a parent plant where competition among siblings may be high. And it also allows plants to reach and colonize new habitats. So, in that way, um, seed dispersal can ensure the long-term survival of the plant species and can have some cascading impact on ecosystem functioning and maintenance of biodiversity. It does affect the maintenance of diversity within a plant community because the seeds that fall to the ground, known as the seed rain, uh, form this initial template for future vegetation composition that will determine the structure of the plant community. So, in fact, uh, seed dispersal determines the plant spatial patterns, which may then influence their interactions with other plants, either through competition or facilitation, as well as their interactions with abiotic uh, factor and natural enemies. And all of that will influence community composition and diversity because they are affecting plants of Bible. So in that sense, um, seed dispersal by animals is, is even more critical in biodiversity hotspots like in Madagascar, where the majority of the highly diverse flora depend on animals for the seed dispersal. So, for example, um, in the rainforest of Ranmafara National Park that you, know, you saw earlier, where I've been conducting my research, up to 87% of trees and large shrubs are dispersed by frugivores. Uh, by, yeah. And then the majority of these are primarily dispersed by lemurs. So, what I'm, what I'm interested in is to understand the impact of seed dispersal by lemurs on plants at multiple levels, from population level to the community and ecosystem. And as I mentioned earlier, I've been conducting research on these three lemur species uh, Illumir griffiffrans, Illumir griffiffrans, and Paresia variegata editorum, which are among the largest uh, frugivores in Madagascar. And because, uh, and um, this lemur, uh, large sized lemur frugivores are able to disperse the seeds of many plant species with a wide range of size from small ones. So, for example, the seeds of strawberry guavas that you can see um, on the, I'm not sure where the left and right here is anymore, but like the psidium catelinium from the feces of Illumeric Preventer. And they're also able to disperse the large one, like the seeds of Cryptocaria crassifolia. But because they are the largest frugivores in the system, they are the primary responsible for the dispersal of the large seeded plant species. And um, to address my main goal of understanding the impact of seed dispersal by lemurs on plants, 
We collect various kinds of data and use different approaches, and um, that includes uh, lima follows to collect data on the movement, feeding and defecation. We also do some experiments with seeds and different microhabitats. Uh, we also monitor fruit and phen um, phenology. We do some vegetation surveys. We collect seeds in like seeds and feces using crabs that look like little baskets. We analyze traits um, to some simulations. So there are many different approaches and like field-based and um, and also like um, statistical analysis that we use to to uh, address our questions. And one of the points that we found was that um, lemurs disperse seeds in a non-random way. Um, this is because they forage and use habitats in a very non-random way. So what I mean by that would be like, for example, the case of these filumer uh, reflectants, they tend to turn back to their previous location uh, often. So like they backtrack, so they go to one place and they always go back. And even if they move around the whole day, starting at one point, and they always return to certain trees for feeding or for resting. So basically, they repetitively use the same route within the habitat with frequently uh, reuse of certain trees or certain sites. And so by what this means is that the seeds that the seeds may be deposited into these frequently used areas. And one of such impact can be observed on in the recruitment pattern of Cryptocarya crassifolia. This is a long-lived canopy tree that has been dispersed by the Freelimer species. So we compare the probability recruitment of the seeds that were non-randomly dispersed by the Freelimer species, and then the seeds that were not dispersed, but just dropped under the parent plants. And so we use this based on the data on the observation of um, three groups of each one of the Limer species and data on seed fate experiments. So we planted seeds in, in different locations of where the lemurs would disperse seeds. And what we found was that the seeds that were dispersed by this um, lemur species uh, had higher high seedling recruitment and like compared to the seeds that just dropped under the parent plant with an estimated fourfold higher recruitment probability. Um, for seeds by Lima, like dispersed by lemurs and the seeds that were not dispersed. And the main reason for this observation is because um, these lemurs tend to deposit seeds in microhabitats that are suitable for the germination of these specific plant species. So specifically, like under microhabitats that have more open canopy cover and away from the parent plant. And another point that we found, we also found was that these lemur frugivores tend to bias uh, seed dispersal near fruiting trees uh, where they recently fed because they spend a large proportion of their time foraging for fruits and hanging around fruiting trees. And sometimes they defecate while they're foraging or even between feeding pods. And so this um, behavior resulted in non-random association between dispersed seeds and their adult neighbor. So for example, if let's say these two plant species are fruiting at the same time, and they are dispersed by the same lemur seed dispersers, their seeds will be dispersed under each other. So basically, the lemur structure this early stage pattern of plant community structure. And this uh, seed adult associations are critical because the proximity of the seed with other plants could influence its interactions with both biotic and abiotic environment, as well as its survival and recruitment success. And um, the last point I want to talk about is that we also found that because the, the seed dispersal service can have this critical impact on the demography of the plants that they interact with, losing these lemurs uh, can have some cascading impact on the ecosystem 
So we found that it can also like affect the ability of the forest to provide vital uh, goods and services to human society. Uh, for example, uh, carbon storage by influencing the ability of the forest um, to stop the carbon, as an example. And also the absence of this limer seed disperser from an area also affects the structure and regeneration pattern in the forest. And so that's my research in a very small, like in a nutshell, these are some of my research findings. I tried to cover in a very brief amount of time, but there are still a lot of questions to be answered about seed dispersal by lemurs. And my lab still continues working on this topic and you might hear more about my, uh, how, what lemur are doing with plants in the near future. Uh, but before I, we, before Ariel comes back and asks questions, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my amazing um, team of local field technicians and students who have helped, like who have helped me in many ways, and they've played um, very critical roles in the success of my research. So this, everything I've been presenting in my research, like it hasn't been possible without the knowledge and the help and everything they do. So really grateful for the Thank you so much. That was an amazing talk. And I'm really excited to get to the question. So um, if you have not submitted your question for Orange, please be sure to do so right now. Um, our first question comes from H. It was, it was early on. Okay. Um, uh, H asks, could you tell us a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic affected Madagascar? Yeah, uh, well, it did affect Madagascar at the same, I guess, the same way as every other place, um, some, anywhere else as well. But I also think, because Madagascar rely a lot on tourism as part of the income, and I think it really affected the livelihoods of the Malagasy people because the tourism industry was closed for a long time. And yeah, there were like the, the flights where there were no flights before. And so it did affect the economy in that sense. Um, like, and also like thinking about, if I'm thinking specifically about my research, like research in general, or like fieldwork, Lima research, or fieldwork in general, it also has impacted um, not only like people unable to go to Madagascar to do research, but also the local communities unable to like go into the forest and do research or like the local community gaining some, um, some uh, income from the research that they are usually doing. Well, th thank you for your answer and, and each thank you for your question. Our next question actually has to do with tourism um, from Jeannie. Uh, how does tourism affect the Madagascar environment and lemur habitat? Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm like the correct person to answer <laughs> because I'm not very like know much about what's going on in the tourism industry. Uh, the small things I can say maybe that it has some benefits in like lemur conservation in many ways because well, for one thing, it helps with like the the protection of the the, the habitat because the, the tourism again brings money in Madagascar and it can be used to to protect the lemurs. People are interested in like visiting lemurs. That's where the only place you can see lemurs in the wild. Um, so I would say that it has um, some benefits on lemur conservation and habitat in Madagascar. But again, um, I don't know if that's very satisfying as a response, but I might not be the right person to answer about tourism in Madagascar. Yeah, oh well, yeah, we'll, we'll have to maybe, you know, think about having you know, more on more conservation and yeah. in future episodes. Um, so our next question comes from Pete. Uh, Pete asks, uh, uh, are the lemurs able to find fruit all year and do they travel depending on what is ripe? Yes, um, they are able to find fruits all year, but <laughs> there is always a bad in here. 
it's like so the fruits are like the trees are fruiting year round, but the the peak or like the abundance differs across season. So like they may be able to find some fruits and also the distribution, the spatial. So it's the spatial and temporal distribution of the fruits vary. So like they may have to travel really far away to find fruits during some time, or some days they may just like find fruits in one place and do not move. So like even that availability of food resources also affects the movement and where they will find fruits. Um, yeah. Really cool. interesting. Um, so we actually, uh, Jeannie has another question for you um, that kind of goes along with this. Has climate change affected the lemur's environment, um, uh, such as the timing of the ripening of fruit? It's a really interesting question. Yeah, so going back to that, like the abundance of fruits that are, um, that of fruiting, climate change, I think there have been changes in when Fruits are, like trees are fruiting and the abundance as well because it gets a little bit like drier and so less fruits and eventually that will affect the available resources of the lemurs. Really interesting. Uh, and uh, Ruben has a has a has a another good question. They're working really good questions today. Um, uh, Ruben says, I, I saw an article about singing lemurs in Madagascar. Have you noticed them singing different songs based on when they find different fruit? <laughs> Very interesting. And I really like that question, but I don't know, the, like I haven't noticed that, but I want to know, and I will pay attention when I go to Madagascar this May, trying to see if there are like some different songs. Hmm. Well, anyway, report back to us. Report back, report back to us. To <laughs> um, so let's hear. Um, who, who, are, who, are, who is our next question from? Let's see here. Ah, oh, Jan. Um, our next question comes from Jan uh, from our website, and she asks: Many species of lemurs are threatened. What would a world without lemurs look like, and uh, how would that impact the ecosystem? I don't want to get to that world though. That there are no lemurs. Um, yeah. How the world without Lima would look like? So, if I'm thinking about the the them as providing these critical ecosystem services, a world without Lima would mean that the the habitat will also change because they're not the seeds are not gonna get dispersed, and the trees will not there will not be new seedlings and new saplings and new trees to be placed. And that will change a lot of the communities of plants. And by changing the communities of plants, that will also change the community of other animals in the forest because many other animals also rely on those trees for shelter, for food, for many other things. So yeah, there will be a lot of changes. And I really don't wanna get to that place where we don't have lemurs. Not just because because of like how it may affect our world, but also because I want to protect them and I want to have them forever for the future generations to have to enjoy and appreciate. Absolutely. I, and, you know, and hopefully, you know, with with conservation efforts and and people like you, you know, talking about lemurs, you know, we'll, we'll get more information out there and, and help protect them. Um, OK, so our next question actually comes also from Jeannie. Um, uh, are there any science, uh, other scientists in your family uh, who became your role models? No, I'm my first generation um, uh, with higher education. No one in my family is um, doing science. My parents didn't even go to middle school. They stopped in primary school, only able to like read and count very basic counting. And then um, my siblings, um, some of them went to um, did, uh, went to the university, um, but like none of them were scientists and so I'm first generation and none of my cousins at that time. Now I have more cousins who went to um, university like, or college students, but at, at that time when I started, I didn't 
have anyone as role models. That's one of the things too. Is like, I didn't even know what a work of a scientist is. Like, I learned science in school, but like, didn't it didn't catch into my head that someone like me could do that because I didn't have anyone like me doing that. Well, you know, congratulations. You, your your work is just is is so important and amazing, and um, and you know, it, like you're a role model of so many. Um, our next question comes from Brandon. Uh, Brandon asks, "What is the most challenging part of your field work, and what is the most rewarding part?" Good book, good bookend question. Yeah, so I would say the most challenging is trying to find the, a group of lemurs in the morning. Um, sometimes they are super hard to find. And I'm doing a non-invasive approach where like um, none of the lemur groups we study have any colors or anything. So we rely on the not, like prior knowledge of like where to find these groups. And sometimes that's hard because sometimes we like we hike for hours and hours and just nothing. Sometimes we're lucky and they come to our camp in the morning and wake us up and let's go. But most of the time it's just very challenging to find the limits. Um, what's most rewarding for my field work wise? I think it's the, the joy of being in the forest and the joy of working with um, my fellow Malagasy um, people folks, I really enjoy being like, I have this big extended family in the in the forest working with me and I really love that. And yeah, it's just like, I'm looking forward, like we're planning to go to Madagascar in May and I can't, I can't stop talking about this sense <laughs> because like, it's, it's possible to go to Madagascar now because like, yeah. I wasn't able to go for the past three. It's been, yeah, it's almost three years. And now I'm like, I can go. And I've been talking about it every single day. <laughs> My love may be like tired of me listening about that and speaking, talking about that every single day. But like, I wanna go because I, yeah, I really, I, I miss that. Like I miss my family, like my actual family in Madagascar, but also miss my extended family in the forest. and my my camp and my tent and being there in the forest. I just love it. Well, you know, it's just exciting to, to hear, you know, your passion and, and that you're really doing what you love doing. Um, our next question comes from Diane. Uh, Diane uh, from our is uh, from our website and asks, uh, the Malagasy food looks delicious. Can you tell us what is being served? Ooh, um, so we, do so eat a lot of rice, uh, that's one of the, this is like rice and some vegetables that we have. This is one of our food in the, when we were doing field work. And uh, so it's usually rice and something, anything that you can eat with rice and call it Malagasy food. <laughs> Even French fries. Uh, the, the last picture that you just saw, that's my favorite dish actually, uh, not the one after that. Okay. The one with the beans. Um, it, it'll be yeah. up just a second, yeah. It's the, oh, there we go. Beans. I want to call them beans, but they're on under like in, underground. So I have no idea what it's called. I've been trying to find. Like I've seen one store in the U.S. selling them, and it's called. Like, they sell it as yellow beans. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my favorite beans ever. And that's, yeah. Well, they, 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 they look delicious. It is very delicious. And you just like make some um, tomato sauce and cook it in. Oh, you can also like cook it in coconut milk or something mm. and eat it rice. Uh, we, we have another question, I believe, from Ruben. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, can we get that mug somewhere? I actually don't know. It was a gift from my PhD advisor. I can ask her and let people know. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, do you want let let's take a, a up close look at the mug one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. This one. This way. Is it clear enough? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's such a cool mug. Um, 
So my, my last question for you is, do you have any advice for those just starting out or hoping to pursue a career in science? Um, very good question. Um, so one thing that I would say to those who are just starting or just curious is just keep being curious. Um, and also like find something that you're passionate about and go for it. Um, you may not have like the perfect research question right away. You may not have the perfect approach to address that question, but I think that's the beauty of science. You get to test your ideas, test your hypothesis about something that you're curious about. And the answer to that will lead you to another exciting question and then you keep exploring. So like having that curiosity and like going for it and being passionate about it, I think everything else will fall in because if you're not passionate, if you're not interested in doing like nothing matter in that sense, like I, I, that's how I see it. Um, like find that something that you're passionate about and just go for it. And it's okay to be curious. It is good to be curious. Absolutely. And that's really that, you know, that staying curious is great advice for all of us. Yes. So, well, Anshu, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ariel, for like, inviting me to be here and be part of this series. And as we say in Malagas, um, we suck your pizza. So, thank you. Well, next time on Lunch Break Science, we meet Leaky Grantee, Aaron Vogel, and learn about orangutan diets, nutrition, and conservation for a very special Earth Day episode. Definitely, I hope you all tune in. So thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. Hello. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leaky Foundation and made possible by the generous support of the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation and Camilla and George Smith. Right now, all donations to the Baldwin Scholar Program will be quadruple matched by generous sponsors, meaning your impact will be quadrupled. Subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about exciting upcoming episodes and programs. Miss an episode of Lunch Break Science? Catch up on past episodes and browse our library of Leaky Foundation lectures on our YouTube channel. Still hungry for science and can't wait till our our next episode, uh, check out Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast. Origin Stories is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Visit us at leakyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, today's guest scientists, our education programs, research grant and scholarship opportunities, human evolution news, how you can help support human evolution research and programs like Lunch Break Science, and much, much more. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.